We're going to talk with Dr. Larby Okada today on GC Conversations. <music> Hello, welcome to GC Conversations, a show where each week we bring in faculty, staff, alumni, and friends, and we talk all things Georgia College. I'm your host, Wendell Staten, and thank you for joining us today right here on NBC TV 4 and also WRGC 88.3 FM, our NPR affiliate right here on our Georgia College campus. So, folks, we've got a real treat for you today, and for those of you listening out there, Dr. Larry Okada, uh, who is the chair of our Department of Modern Languages and cultures, cultures. And, nice. uh, uh, and and we actually just met recently and, 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 and I found out that you participated in the 1968 Summer Olympics. That's correct. And so you were one of our favorite faculty members uh, that from our student athletes. And yeah. so I thought, wow, what an interesting story to talk about. And, and I want to get to the 68 Olympics in a minute, uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how long have you been here at Georgia College? Yeah. Well, first, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I am anxious also to know a little bit about the athletics yeah. at Georgia College. I arrived here about 18 months ago, so a year and a half, and I uh, came from Indiana. Okay, so you were and at the university in Indiana. Uh, I was at Indiana University, Purdue yep. uh, University at Indianapolis. Right. Uh, IUPUI? That's correct. That, that. That's yeah. correct. That's <laughs> correct. That's uh, correct. And uh, uh, and then so, uh, but you're not originally. Uh, you're from Morocco. That's correct. Really, right? Mm -hmm. So, so how did you uh, uh, matriculate to the United States? Uh, well, in general, actually, it was thanks to athletics. Okay. I was uh, at an event called European Cross Country in Ostend, uh, Belgium, and in, I I placed uh, fourth in the European Championship for Juniors. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in an honor table with the U.S. Uh, cross-country coach. And we proceeded to talk in my very, very then broken English. Right. Uh, during which, uh, during the conversation, the coach invited me to join his varsity team. And huh. that's what got started. Otherwise, uh, and this was, this was when, 19 what? This was in 1967. Okay, and so, so you were uh, coming over here for college or for high school or what? How did no, he, what do you want you to join? Uh, a, a college. It was a, okay. a college in western Kansas called Fort Hayes yeah. Kansas State College. And it was a premier college in running in the NEIA uh, right. division. Yeah. So, yeah, Fort Hayes State. Uh, that, uh, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, so 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 uh, so you came to the United States for college. That yes, on, the, on, on a on a track and field scholarship. Right. Yes. Okay. All right. And then uh, so when you got here, uh, have you stayed here in the United States, or did you go back and forth to Morocco over the years in your career, or have you pretty much been in the United States? Well, as you know, uh, destiny it's usually not planned. So <laughs> one event led to another. I got married, then children and. Decided to stay in the U.S. Okay, and, uh, but we do visit Morocco okay. on a frequent basis. Well, that's an interesting story in that that here you are in Europe, running as a as a as a as a, as a young man, and and you just happen to be sitting at a table. Absolutely. And then the rest of your life yes. is, is based on you know that conversation. That's yes. really neat. I always maintained that life is just a series of incidents, yeah. and, and that was a fortunate incident for me. Yeah, very, yeah, very neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so in '67, uh, you go, you come to the United States, and, and uh, as you said, you didn't, you, your you probably didn't, your English wasn't great at that time. Uh, and now I know you're almost non-existent. Okay, okay, all right. So, so all tell right. us about that. Uh, uh, now, you had done some traveling because yeah. you were in Europe, but, but so you leave Morocco and you come to the United States not knowing anyone probably other than that one person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How would that work out? How'd well, go? before I do that, yeah, let me yeah. just share with you Please. the level of my linguistic proficiency in 1967 okay. when it came to English language. I honestly thought that little Richard song where he says, Wapab, Lumab, Lapab, I thought he was saying some kind of English sentence with. Okay. with words <laughs> and, and it's after I came to the US and I was driving one day and I heard that song and it dawned on me 
Uh, those were not words. That, <laughs> that is the extent of my English knowledge. No, I think I was very fortunate to come to the U.S. and, and go to Kansas where I was really welcomed. In fact, I tell people in France and in Morocco, wherever I go, one of the virtues in the U.S. is that you don't feel like a foreigner. Mm -hmm. And I felt at home, uh, was welcomed by my teammates, and I had a really a wonderful experience during which I quickly acquired the ability to at least function using right. English and, and certainly in the classroom. So it was a, a wonderful experience, certainly from an academic point of view, but it was also a wonderful opportunity to train very seriously right. and, 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 and to grow uh, in, in athletics as well. So I want to switch gears real quick. Tell us a little bit about Morocco for our folks who aren't familiar with Morocco. It's location, it's, it's uh, population, all those types of things. Yeah. I always tell people that Morocco is an exotic place because when I go to Morocco, I seem like not, not only I'm traveling in space from one place to another, but I'm also traveling in time. Uh, you see a lot of things that uh, perhaps existed since the Renaissance time. So in that way, it's a fascinating place to visit uh, because the culture is drastically unique. Mm -hmm. uh, diversified uh, and offers a lot uh, for visitors. So I certainly encourage people to consider Morocco as a place to f visit. What's the population there? Morocco, Morocco is a, a kingdom. Uh, there's a king and it has a population of 35 uh, million people. Okay. And it consists largely, largely of two major ethnic groups. One, the Arabs that came in the 7th century to spread Islam to this part of the world. And the other ethnic group is the early inhabitants of Morocco called Berbers. Okay. And they trace back their origin uh, to Europe. And they speak a very unique and different language called Berber. And what are, would be some of the major economies of Morocco? Morocco leans heavily on tourism as a source for revenues. And, and again, because it has mountains, it has beautiful beaches, uh, it has a diff, you know, a, a diverse uh, artistic uh, manifestation in pottery, in rug making, and in jewelry, for instance. Uh, uh, so it has a lot to, uh, a, a beautiful weather too, uh, a wonderful cuisine. So it, it, it attracts about 7 million tourists a year. Wow. So that's a Good. major uh, revenue for Moroccan. It's also uh, the number one producer of phosphate. Okay. And it has really a vibrant economic activity at the moment. So it's. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. We're up against our first break, sure. and uh, so we're going to come back with Dr. Larry Okada. I'm Wendell Staten. We'll be right back on GC Conversations. Up to 40% of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov business. It's not his new group of friends. It's not the video games. It's not the neighborhood. Mom, do I have to go to school today? The biggest threat to your child's future could be you. Every day they miss, even in middle school, puts their graduation at risk. Hello and welcome back to GC Conversations. I'm your host, Wendell Staten. Today we're joined by Dr. Larry Okada, the chair of our Modern Languages and Cultures Department and a participant in the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City. And uh, I want to I go right into that. And uh, wow, I mean, I t I'll tell you, uh, uh, and again, growing up as a huge track and field person, and, and the Olympics in those times were much different, I think, than today. 
but uh, uh, I mean, it's a real privilege to get to talk to someone who was who was participating in that. So tell me about the Olympics in Mexico City. And, and when I think of the Mexico City Olympics, you think of uh, a number of things. The, the altitude was one thing, the Bob Beeman jump, the, uh, uh, the, the Tommy Smith, the glove demonstration. Uh, but there was even more than that. There was a Czechoslovakian uh, uh, Czechoslovakia demonstration. There was, a, there was actually a massacre right before the Olympics that mm-hmm. happened there. So uh, first Olympics in Latin America. Um, First torch held, uh, with a, it was lit by a female. Uh, mm-hmm. Just all kinds of things. Kip Kino, Jim Ryan, I mean, you name it, it had it. So, <laughs> nah. so tell me about this as a, as, a, as a young man participating in this from Morocco. And I don't know how big the Morocco contingent was. If it was, you know, a uh, hundred uh, folks from Morocco, I, I don't know how that went. But everybody lived in a village and all those kinds of things. So take me from start to finish. First of all, there was this massacre, about 44 uh, students had gotten killed before that. Was there any danger? Did you guys didn't know about that? I know the news cycle wasn't like it w- was now, but w- was were you aware of at least that? Yeah, it certainly was in the news that students were writing prior to the Olympics to make a statement. But by the time athletes arrived to Mexico City, there was no uh, visual evidence of anything's happening. Okay. And my understanding, what I discovered later, was that uh, the government uh, worked out a deal with the students to quiet them during the Olympics. So during the month of uh, October, November 68, there were no activities during the Olympics. Uh, uh, You were mentioning about the Olympic Village. uh, uh, One of the really lesson that I took from the participation in the Olympics was the way I felt when I entered the Olympic Village. They told us that there were 10,000 athletes from about 121 countries. And walking to that place, seeing people that speak different languages coming from totally different ethnic groups, coming from totally different government systems, yet get it along so yeah. beautifully. It made me really think that peace and harmony are possible in the world. I still firmly believe that today, based on really witnessing people coming from different parts of the world right. that share this planet, that uh, we're brothers and sisters. I think that's one of the beautiful things about the Olympics, and in general about athletics, that you really don't care about all the other stuff. Yes, You're just competing against each other as brothers. Yeah, yeah. You work as hard as you can. You shake hands. Yeah. You move on. Yeah, and, yeah, that's, that's okay. and for ten thousand people yeah. to not really, you know, uh, someone whose country is going through this or going through that or whatever their regime is, you don't really care. You're just having a meal yeah, with someone. That's, that's really a beautiful absolutely, thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you were talking about there were some. Uh, great moments during that Olympics and in some kind of an odd way about destiny I was really present in a lot of them Bob Beeman jump that you mentioned I was about 25 yards away from that jump when he made it and all of us there realized that there was something huge and big and just 10 minutes later I actually started raining uh, so he just had that moment where he made the jump. The same thing about uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, after running the 200 uh, raised their fist to, right. with a glove as a, a making a, a really a political statement. Uh, and it was such a, a big event that I personally forgot that there was a second person in the race that placed second and that person was white, and that person was from Australia, which is not known for producing sprinters. Right. But uh, uh, for many, many years, I had in my office a poster of that, huh. that picture there with that Tommy uh, Smith and John Carlos uh, raising their fist. And, and at that time, uh, I don't, and again, not being there, obviously, uh, um, I was one at the time, but but was it? Were you aware that were the athletes aware that this is a big statement and what was going on in, in the United States and with race relations? Was that 
I think we were uh, we were aware of racial situations in the U.S. I, I personally, when I saw that, I didn't understand what it was right. and was the purpose. Later on, obviously, people were talking about it, uh, and I came to appreciate it as athletes has also have also uh, or need to participate in our society and make statements when that's feasible and possible. And I've seen these two guys, even to this day, as two brave athletes that uh, wanted to make a statement and, uh, and did make a statement right. at, at, at a price, because both of them paid prices in, in being shunned away from, from the athletic organizations. Sure. No, I, I think you, you, you bring up a very interesting point, which would be a, a topic we could talk about for hours, but you go back to Cassius Clay and and and, 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 and uh, uh, would later be Muhammad Ali and, and his stance against being drafted and serving in the, in the war. Uh, but, but you are right. Uh, sometimes athletes who have this platform Absolutely. are maybe don't want to do that because they don't want to be alienated. Uh, yeah. I go back yeah. to, you know, yeah. uh, Michael Jordan a few years ago had said, well, uh, they want him to endorse a particular candidate. And he said, well, uh, all candidates buy my sneakers. You know, all people, you know, so all parties buy my sneakers. So a lot of people are a little bit scared to do that. But uh, that was a very interesting yeah, yeah. statement. Yeah, yeah. So right. I, I hear a lot of social things. And at the Olympics, it's almost always there's some of these controversies or uh, you know, statements or, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting, but, yeah. but again, like you said, in the village. Oh, I'm sorry, it's well, that. Yeah, I forgot to. <laughs> <laughs> forgot to tell you to turn it off before and, we got started. And this is my son calling from uh, Phoenix. <laughs> I'll turn it off. Sorry about that. Hey, it's live TV, folks. That yes. <laughs> so, uh, but inside the athlete's village, you really don't get a, you know, you don't get all the. And that's the neat thing, I think, of the story that you're telling is that people get along. Yeah, you know, so I, oh, I, absolutely, absolutely. There, there were obviously some transformation at that time, as you know very well, sports was very amateurish. Right. And you did it for the sake of sport. Today it's a little bit uh, uh, integrated with a business yes. outlook yes. to it, you know. Yes. So, yeah. And uh, so that that's, uh, in fact, when I think about the, uh, the you were earlier on talking about Morocco and how they stand uh, in terms of running. Morocco is always placed as the second uh, most uh, powerful country in running after Kenya. Right. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the current world record holder for the mile is a Moroccan right. in the Greece Olympics, the winner for the 1500 meter as well as the 5000 meter. No, it was Moroccan. And I think for the last 30 years, the record for a mile and 1,500 bel belonged to Moroccans. So Moroccans were all always decent okay. in distance running. But when I was, at uh, the time I was running, obviously the most you will earn as an amateur athlete was a, a watch. Right. In sure. fact, in 69, I was voted most outstanding athlete in Kansas relays. Mm -hmm. At a time where Jim Ryan right. uh, ran, uh, at a time where uh, John Carlos in the right. 200 ran, and Watson, he was a shot putter. There were a lot of elite runners, but having won that uh, prestigious honor, being the most outstanding athlete at Kansas Relays, uh, I was given a watch, right. uh, and so that was the extent of it. Today, somebody like the the world record holder in a mile uh, requires two hundred fifty thousand dollar as a participation fee, right. not even uh, for winning the race. Yeah, and, yeah. and so it has transformed to uh, profit making a business uh, uh, entity to it as well. It really has. We're we're up against a break. We're past our break, and so uh, we're going to come back for our last segment with Dr. Larry Okada. I'm Wendell State on GC Conversations. Really? Buzz, what's up, man? You left some leaves burning out here. Yeah, I, I just I, there was a I had just came in just for a second. Come on, man. If it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. You could torch the whole neighborhood. It's a good point. There's smoke. 
key. Nine out of 10 wildfires are caused by humans. Only you can prevent wildfires. GC Conversations for our last segment with Dr. Larry, o Larry Okada. I'm Wendell Staten, and, and uh, we left off talking about, uh, again, about the six-day Olympics and running, and Morocco uh, has, has had this long line of distance runners. Let's talk about that first of all. Uh, uh, where did that come from? Did you, is it just as a kid, it's a very popular sport, and a lot of folks run in Morocco? Because uh, they, they've dominated for years. Yeah. No, I think it has to do with a variety of factors. Uh, let me just share with you some of them that I reflected on. One has to do with the way of life. Uh, obviously, there people walk more uh, and use transportation less. A second one really has to do with the quality of food once eat there. Obviously, mom, uh, bless her soul, uh, uh, she prepared fresh uh, food. So if you combine a way of life that uh, is more athletic in nature okay. by walking and as kid we used to be involved in all kind of outdoor activities, not, not so much organized outdoor right. activities, but just uh, uh, in a neighborhood, uh, I think gave us the capacity to run. Uh, I did not even know that I was uh, uh, potentially a good runner until something happened similar to what happened to you because I heard you say that, that story. Uh, I was one day waiting to play soccer with some friends and there came the, um, a PE teacher in our middle school who was trying to organize a time trial to see who could represent the middle school in our regional academic uh, right. school uh, championship. And he said, hey, Larby, why don't you come join us? And since we were just waiting for somebody to bring a ball, I said, why not? I end up winning that race. I end up also winning the National Scholastic Championship for Morocco and discovered that I was a natural runner. But when I reflected on the why, and that was your question, I literally, literally walked somewhere around eight miles to go to school on okay. a daily basis. So wow. eight miles going one way, eight miles going the So, and that was just a fun thing to do as right. a kid. You didn't pay too much attention. And there is no, to this day, to this day, there is no transportation offered by schools. Okay. And I just had to take a city bus or walk or. Right. And things. So the way of life, I think, okay. contribute to that capacity have bigger lungs or better cardiovascular system right. that w will make you a natural runner. Well, I um, I hear you saying um, again a more maybe a more active lifestyle a diet uh, mm -hmm. a little bit different as well. But a lot of the, it's, it's it's very interesting. Again, you talk about a series of incidents. How this one yeah. PE teacher, and the yeah. next thing you know. Uh, uh, a few years later, you're in the Olympics. Uh, yeah. let, let's talk about, I want to go back to the uh, Mexico City, because the altitude, you're at high altitude in Mexico City, which was not good for the distance runners mm. uh, at that time. And you ran in the in Olympics of uh, 3,000 meter steeplechase. Right. Uh, did you notice that when you got to Mexico City, you're running? Did you breathe I, differently? I'm telling you, it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in running, we, we accept the fact that it's going to be pain associated with running, but, but the altitude 
uh, gives you a burning sensation, like something is burning inside your lungs, okay. and, and it is. And fortunately for the Moroccan delegation, we spent uh, two weeks in the Pyrenees between France and uh, Spain as a way to train in the altitude and get your body acclimated to, uh, right. to, to eat. But that's not enough. You need to do it more than two months to, okay. to get your body used to that kind of uh, thin air right, in, right. In, in the Mexico altitude. Because I noticed uh, in, 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 in that the, the times weren't as good, but the jumps were better. Like the Bob yes, Beeman. Right. I mean, Bob Beeman broke the long jump record by almost yeah, two yeah, feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and there were a world record in the 400 yeah. meters. And, uh, yeah, sprinters. Yeah, the sprinters. Had, yeah, it was wonderful for them. Long distance yeah. runner was just the opposite. Yes. It, was very, <laughs> it was very painful. <laughs> That's an interesting story about how painful when you get there and you yeah, start running yeah, off. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we were just off the air. Uh, uh, you went to Fort Hay State, and 45 years later, you still have the uh, 5,000 and 10,000 uh, meters uh, uh, record for the school at a great track program, right. by the way. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, before I came to your show this morning, I checked the website, and they do have a, a place where it has the school track record, and my name is still listed as a the holder. And in fact, when I think about my athletic accomplishment, I really think participation in the Olympics, at least I never felt it was like a big deal. But having a college record 40 years later, yeah. that, that's my biggest accomplishment. That's the one that I'm most proud yeah. of. And I would agree and with I, that. And I'd be very, very, very happy and I send congratulations to any young person that would be those records. But as you've seen in the screen, uh, 10K at a 28 minutes, 45 seconds, that's still, even today, in Georgia, a very good time. Yeah. Oh, and your, and your 5K at that time yeah. was in the 14s and low 14s. And, and, and again, I asked you off the air, and even though the mile wasn't your event, but you ran a sub four minute mile. There's only so many humans alive that have ever done that. Yeah. <laughs> and, that it's just, and again, for a runner, someone who's who read track and field news growing up, yeah. uh, that's just phenomenal. To, to, I, uh, I should remind you that I waited uh, for somebody who's six feet tall. My weight then was uh, 142. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that helped a lot. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I just think uh, a neat story and, 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 and track. And your running obviously took you all over the world, and and some of your greatest experiences were through these travels and races yeah. and meeting people and all yeah. that. Maybe kind of reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Wendell, because uh, I honestly think that athletics have guided me in the right direction. It has made me a better student because, as you know, participating in varsity team required that you maintain a certain standard right. or a certain average. Uh, and it also helped me and guided me in leading a healthier life. Uh, as you know very well, when you're an athlete, you cannot indulge in drinking or smoking. Right. And, uh, and I always maintain that, uh, as people have said centuries ago, uh, a sound body with a sound mind. So that, that I think uh, they support one another. Right. Uh, so certainly uh, there are many dividends to uh, young people actively participating uh, in athletic events or uh, rec training right. uh, as we have a beautiful rec center here. Um, uh, because the dividend uh, are not just uh, immediate uh, as one feels good, but also as a preparation for being in good health later on right. in life. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. yeah, all around, uh, I cannot uh, stress enough yeah. how important for anyone to be uh, athletically active. All those miles that you have covered over your years have, will continue to benefit you from a health perspective. Absolutely, yeah. years later. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we are out of time, and so, I could talk for another six hours, but it has been a real treat, and I appreciate you it's being a, here. my pleasure. Yeah, so for Dr. Laurie Okada, Okada, excuse me, I'm Wendell Staten. Thanks for joining us on GC Conversations. Mm -hmm.